personal duty. It is not an option. It is a duty to know whose shoulders we stand on, to know the Constitution that has made us the nation that we are today. Before we go any further, let me just tell you that Patriots, which is what we call Patriots of Gillespie County for short, is all about the grassroots effort. It's all about citizen involvement. We are entirely nonprofit and we are volunteer based. We do not have a budget. We have very faithful volunteers who have paid for this entire program. After you leave this evening, we hope that you too will be inspired to answer the call. You, each, and, each one of you has a call because you have the duty to rise up and take a stand for the principles that this country was founded upon. That you will seek leaders in this next election that are willing to abide by their oath, an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. Yes. If they cannot talk about it, they don't know it. What we want to know and we want you to know is that it starts right here at home. We cannot bring creative, patriots cannot bring these creative, out of the ordinary opportunities to you without your financial help. I'm going to be honest with you. We have donation stations posted in the back here. Please consider making the most generous donation that you can, um, knowing that you're investing in your community and ways that, like planting a seed, you, there will be many manifestations of that. I want to especially thank the Hangar Hotel and the staff for all of their support. We could not have done this without them. And our steering committee and volunteers, if you folks would please stand up so I could recognize you for your tireless work for the last year. I'm not the only one that did this, believe me. Gail Kibble took such good care of me tonight. Thank you very much. And Tanya Benson, I could not live without this woman. We are soul sisters. Um, now I want to introduce Gordon Gibson, a friend and citizen volunteer, who will give you a glimpse of a seminar that we are hosting for peace officers on Tuesday, February the 9th. And he will also tell you about the Appleseed Project, which is another event that we are coordinating. Gordon? Thank you. Wow, we've got a great crowd here tonight. That's what we were hoping for. Thank you, Angela. Thank every one of you for being here tonight. It means a lot to me, and it means a lot, I'm sure, to everyone associated with this event. My name is Gordon Gibson, and I'd like to thank you for being here. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the events and some of the projects that we're working on. First of all, uh, the Patriots of Gillespie County is excited and proud to be the first in Texas to host the Constitution for Peace Officers. This is a four-hour seminar that brings the Constitution out of obscurity with special emphasis on law enforcement professionals. We're making this free of charge to the area law enforcement and our current law enforcement community here in Gillespie County. The only way that we can offer this free of charge is with people like you that come out to help us bring this event to Fredericksburg and to your area. This seminar will be held here in Fredericksburg on Tuesday, February 9th. That's this coming Tuesday. Sheriff Richard Mack is the instructor and the author of the seminar. If you or someone you know might be interested in helping out, uh, whether it be financially or you all might have someone that you know uh, might want to attend this event, uh, we have a table at the back with information. Uh, please see those kind people uh, and get that information. The American Revolution, April 19, 1775, when marksmanship met history and the heritage was born. The Appleseed Project is a nationwide grassroots program of volunteer instructors from the Revolutionary War Veterans Association with the bold goal of doing just that, 
transforming the America back into a nation of riflemen, one group of Americans at a time, by conducting a two-day rifle clinic across the country. The man that penned these words is our first guest speaker tonight. Patriots will sponsor the Appleseed Project here in Fredericksburg on April 17th and 18th of this year. Volunteer instructors will be here from all across the country for the two-day event. There's also information in the back of the table on this event if anyone's interested. Now, let me introduce Stuart Rhodes, founder and director of Oath Keepers. Stuart is a former U.S. Army paratrooper and firearms instructor. Stuart graduated from Yale Law School in 2004, where his paper, Solving the Puzzle of Any Enemy Combatant Status, won the Yale's Miller Prize for Best Paper on the Bill of Rights. He assisted teaching U.S. military history at Yale, was a Yale research scholar, and is writing a book on the dangers of applying the laws of war to the American people. Stewart has been invited to speak at Stanford University on unlawful enemy combatant status and teaches classes on the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Please join me in giving Mr. Stuart Rhodes a warm Hill Country welcome. It's an honor to be here, folks, and thank you very much for having me. Um, as Gordon said, I wrote an article about Appleseed, the Appleseed program for SWAT magazine, and now Appleseed uses that as their brochure to hand out. So it's a great honor for me to, to have them do that. Um, it's a fantastic program. I encourage every one of you to go on Appleseed and make sure you have the skills of your forefathers, the skills of a rifleman. Very important core uh, skill for an American to have. Um, Gordon talked about April 1917-75. Now, Founding Father George Mason told us that we must remember, return back to core principles, to fundamental principles of our liberty to secure our rights. In this country today, we must return to our bedrock. What's our bedrock? Our bedrock are the principles enunciated in our Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Your rights don't come from government. On April 19, 1775, there was no Second Amendment. They were not rebelling because their constitutional right to bear arms was being violated. They were rebelling and fighting back because their natural rights were being violated by the King and by Parliament. They stood on natural rights principles. This is a natural rights republic. Never forget that. The government today, by hook and by crook, has flipped that on its head. They now assert and claim and behave as if your rights come from government. But if your rights came from government, when could you ever have a right to resist, a right to revolution? If the government determines your rights and the only rights you have are whatever they want to give you, on what grounds could you ever resist? Their courts would just say, oh, that's not a right. And that'd be the end of the argument, right? If that's how it was. That's not how it is. Remember, the Founding Fathers, long before they ever had to fire a shot at Concord and Lexington, they remonstrated, petitioned, and fought court cases for 10, 15 years before the shooting began. Did they win their court cases, or did they lose their court cases? What do you think? By and large, they lost their court cases. But was that the end of the argument? When the British courts upheld all the abuses of their rights, did they just go hat, hat in hand with tail, tail between her legs back home and said, well, that's that, the court's spoken. We don't have a right to this or that, right to jury trial, right to be secure in our homes and free from warrantless searches, the right to bear arms. The court said, no, that's it. That's not what they did. That was not the end of the argument. Today, we face a court system, a government, political, legal, and banking elites who want you to think that they get to determine what your rights are, that they get to determine their own powers, and then when they speak, that's the end of the argument. That's what they want you to think. Is that the truth? No. We stand today very much in a perilous situation of our founding fathers. 
we face very much the same kind of government. Remember, one of the, one of the causes of revolution enunciated in the Declaration of Independence was that the king and parliament claimed a power to regulate them in all cases whatsoever. And what did Thomas Paine say about this? In the crisis of 1776, December 1776, he said this. He said, Britain, with an army to enforce her tyranny, has declared that she has a right not only to tax, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. And if being bound in that manner is not slavery, then is there not such a thing as slavery upon the earth? Even the expression is impious. For such unlimited a power can belong only to God. They rebelled against the very principle because the, the uh, parliament had passed the declaratory act declaring that they had the authority and the power to regulate the colonists in all cases whatsoever, down to the very minutia of their lives. That is what they rebelled against. Did they wait until they felt the full effects of that principle, until it had been done to them in, in every detail? No, they rebelled against the principle. Today we face a government that, much like Parliament back then, claims the power to regulate you in all cases whatsoever. The size of your porch, what kind of toilet you may have, whether or not you till your own soil, what firearms you own. Can you think of anything what doctor you see? Can you think of anything the current Congress does not claim the power to regulate when it comes to your life? Is there anything? What did Pelosi say when someone asked her where in the Constitution do they derive the authority to pass the health care bill? Are you serious, she said? In their mind, they have the power to regulate you in all cases whatsoever. They have flipped on, on its head the principle in our Constitution of enumerated powers. Article 1, Section 8 says what? Congress has certain powers. That's why they're listed there. <laughs> you guys, is this, is this not working? Oh, okay. Okay. I can go without it, <laughs> if I have to. Good to go? Go ahead. All right. Okay, no problem. I'll shout. I get a little worked up sometimes. We are, as I said, facing much the same claim of power. They have flipped on the head, the Constitution, and also the Declaration. When, they, when you look at the Bill of Rights... Is that a list of the, of the rights you have? Is that what that is? Does the Bill of Rights grant you any rights? No. Does it say that the people hereby have a right to free speech and, and worship and assembly? No, it doesn't. It says Congress shall make no law. It's a protection of rights that already existed. Same for the Second Amendment. It doesn't say there that people hereby have a right to bear arms that already preexisted. But they flip that on its head. And as I said, they've also flipped on its head the principle of enumerated powers. What do we do to correct this? Do we rely on politicians to fix it? Do we rely on judges to fix it? Do you rely on the military to fix it? I've had some people email me and ask me, when's the military going to march on Washington, D.C. and set things to right? That would be as unconstitutional, as, as anti-constitutional, as a president claiming to be a dictator. A military coup is also unconstitutional. Whose responsibility is it to fix it? It's your responsibility. In fact, when it comes to military power in this country, what institution is articulated in Article 1, Section 8 as being called forth to enforce the laws of the Union, to suppress insurrections, and repel invasions? That's right. It's not even the standing army. It's the militia. So even if it came down to enforcing the laws of the Union, it's you, the people, who are supposed to do that in your militia, not the standing army. What's the, what's the role of the standing army? To defend us against external threats. Now, one thing I want to talk about real quick, an emphasis about the limits and the balance of power between the federal government and states, here's what, here's what um, Madison said in Federalist 45. 
He said, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The former will be exercised principally on external objects, such as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all objects, which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the lives, liberty, and property of the people, and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. It's supposed to be left to the states to regulate you in your daily life, if at all. That's what's called a general police power. The national government is not supposed to have, and does not have, under our Constitution, a general police power. So how do we fix this? Well, the reason I started Oath Keepers is I saw from firsthand experience of being around politicians and being around judges and other lawyers, I saw that by and large, the vast majority of them violate their oaths every day. They do not believe that they are bound by that oath. They do not act as though they are bound by that oath. They act as though they have a right and a power to do whatever they think is right. They actually believe we're in a democracy. Is this a democracy? A democracy, what's that old saying about a democracy? Two, two wolves and a, and a lamb deciding what's for dinner? That's what a democracy is. If you didn't have natural rights, if you were just an animal, then it wouldn't make a difference what, what you thought or what your inherent rights are. You would have none. Then it's just pure majority rule. That's democracy. This is a constitutional republic. In this constitutional republic, there's a balance of sovereignty between the states and the federal government to secure your rights. You have division of power within the federal government, executive, judicial, and legislative, but you also have a division of power between the federal government and the states. To secure your liberties, you must guard and stand on your state sovereignty. The politicians won't do it. Unless you get new ones in there, as Angela said, you better be voting in. People are going to keep their oath. But until such time as you do, you're going to have to defend your, your own constitution. And that's why, that's why I started Oath Keepers. I wanted to make sure I bought you more time, plain and simple. I focus on the people who have the guns, the military and the police, and also the firefighters who might be given orders to support some kind of violation of your rights. And why do I focus on them? Because they still have some honor, besides the fact that they have the guns, but they still have some honor and integrity and courage. Okay? The politicians and the lawyers, they've, they've demonstrated their lack of honor, with very rare exceptions. I worked for one that was a rare exception, Ron Paul. He's a constitutionalist. There are a few. There's Judge Napolitano, a good judge. So there's hope, and there are now, especially this last year, last two years, more and more state legislators who are sincere constitutionalists. So there is hope in that area. But... To buy more time, that's why I found out Oath Keepers, to concentrate on the men who do have honor and courage to make sure they have the knowledge they need, because courage without knowledge won't do it. They can be as brave and full of integrity as they can be, but if they don't know what's right and wrong, they might follow orders that violate your rights. Okay? Now, the sad truth is there, there are going to be military and police who will follow any order they're given. Lieutenant Commander Guy Cunningham back in 1995, did a survey at 29 Palms asking Marines a series of questions. You might recall that. One of the questions he asked was, was whether they would serve under UN command. Another question he asked, which got much more attention, was whether or not they would fire on Americans who resisted any attempts to disarm them. And the sad results were, even among Marines, who are very dedicated and, and very traditional Americans, even among that branch, with such a, such a proud service, about 24% said they would. They would fire on their fellow citizens who resisted disarmament. But, of course, there were about 24% that said, hell no, we won't do it. And then there were those in the middle that kind of blew whichever way the wind blew and said, you know, I have no opinion. How could you have no opinion about that? I have no idea. But the point is, is that there will be some who will and some who won't. Our, jo our goal with Oath Keepers is to increase the number of those who will not. That's our goal, is to maximize the number who will not. And we do that by teaching them. We remind them that their oath is to the Constitution, not to any person or office. Right there in Article 6 of the Constitution itself, it mandates that all officers, federal and, and state, 
judicial, legislative, and executive must take an oath to support the Constitution, defend the Constitution. The founders put that there for a good reason. And why they put that there? Because who is sovereign in this country? The president? Do we have a king? Who is sovereign? You are. As the Declaration of Independence says, governments are instituted among men to secure these rights, your natural rights, endowing or, or deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. You create the government to secure your rights. That's the purpose of government. And whenever any government violates its own purpose by violating your rights, you have the authority and the power to throw it off. But the government doesn't have the authority and the power to set aside the rules that you put in place. You chose, your forefathers chose, the Constitution as the method of securing your rights. No one in government has the authority to just start doing whatever they want. Only you do. Only the people do. And that's why the supreme law of the land in this country is not the will of the leader. The supreme law in this country is the Constitution itself. And it will remain the supreme law until you decide that it no longer serves your purposes. Okay? That's why there's no requirement that you take an oath to the Constitution, because you're sovereign. You created it. If you want to scrap it, you can. But they can't. The politicians and the judges and the lawyers and even the military cannot set aside the Constitution and do whatever they think is right. Only you can do that as a last resort, as our forefathers faced. What a, what a difference to say about that. He said, well, I'm going to paraphrase it, I can't find it. But basically, here it is. Well, whensoever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. But prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. That is your power. You now face a long train of abuses that just like back then show evidence a desire to place you under absolute tyranny, which means unrestrained government power to do anything they want to to you down to the minutest details of your life. So the military oath, much like the oath for a police officer in a state, is to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And the way they protect it against the domestic enemies is first and foremost by refusing unlawful orders, unconstitutional orders. Obviously, if the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, any order that would violate the Constitution is unlawful. Now, they get education about the laws of war under the UCMJ and you know, to, to design to prevent another My Lai massacre or to prevent another Abu Ghraib situation. They get instruction about the laws of war and not killing civilians, etc. But they don't get enough instruction on the Constitution itself. And so that's our goal, is first to remind them that their oath is to the, to the Constitution, not to a person, and then teach them more about the Constitution they swore to defend. But like I said before, if they don't know it, they can't defend it. So, how do we do this? Well, I see it as a two-pronged approach. There's also you veterans out there, correct? How many here have ever sworn an oath to support and defend the Constitution? Raise your right hand. And keep it up. Or your left hand, I don't care. Okay, did your oath ever expire? If so, put your hand down. Your oath expired? Never did. Okay, you are still duty-bound to defend the Constitution, even as a veteran. And one of the first things you can do is to step up and speak out to the guys that are currently serving and gals. Speak out to them and make sure you set them straight. That look, pal, you know, me and my friends didn't go through hell so that you can throw it all away. 
We didn't fight overseas against fascism and communism so that you can let it happen here at home. You've got to shake them up and remind them of that. A lot of, these, a lot of these young kids will join the military for a job, you know, and they'll take that oath and not even realize what they're doing. You've got to make it a conscious thing. Make it a real thing inside their heart that they feel that I took a sacred oath to defend this Constitution. You've got to do that. They respect you. So every one of you, I encourage you. On our website, we have testimonials. You go to OathKeepers.org, and you'll see testimonials there from veterans and current serving about what their oath means to them still, about their service, about what them and their friends went through, with their combat and vets especially. That's very powerful. It's a very powerful tool. Also on our website is a video, our 10 orders declaration on video, and we've got copies at the back table there. We'll give you a free DVD. Use that too. Download it. Copy it. They call that burning nowadays. Burn that off. Pass it around. Email it to anybody you know in the military. It's a very powerful tool. I had a guy, one of our uh, chapter presidents, our chapter president in Tennessee, his son's a current serving Marine down at Camp Lejeune. And him and his, some Marine buddies came home on leave. And uh, Rand Cardwell, our, our director in Tennessee, showed his son and, and his son's pals that videotape. And at the end of it, they had like tears coming down their face. And he turned to, the, turned to his dad and said, you know what? We will never violate our oaths. We will never enforce and follow orders like that. And here's the orders in summary that we say we will not obey. The point of these, this is not an oath. The oath is the oath we took when we first swore in to support and defend the Constitution. But these are the declaration of orders we will not obey. And the goal there is to set certain lines in the sand that we will not cross. These are the things, these are not the only unlawful orders, obviously, that you could be given. But these are the ones we think that are the most dangerous and would lead to the necessity of another American Revolution. First one is, we will not obey orders to disarm the American people. The reason why that one's number one is not because the Second Amendment or the right to bear arms is more important than the rest of them. It's not more important than the First Amendment. But it is what led to the fighting last time, right, in our first revolution. It's most likely going to be the spark if there ever comes a time for the second one. Remember, though, that the founding fathers had put up with a lot of other abuses of their natural rights. Denial of a jury trial, having the military imposed upon them superior to the civil power under martial law under General Gage, warrantless searches, they went, uh, confiscation of property. Having, having a trial in a, in a court of admiralty across the seas in England. Things like that were done to them long before the shooting started, but it was the attempt at disarm that led to fighting. That's why it's number one. Number two, we will not obey orders to conduct warrantless searches of the American people. Now, when in recent history have you seen house-to-house -house searches to disarm the American people? And Katrina. You know, the Southern Poverty Law Center and other Marxist organizations like that a lot of times they'll try to say we're being paranoid. Well, you can look right back at Katrina, just in very recent history, and see a very cold, very clear example of violations of rights, as though bad weather suspended the Second Amendment and suspended your right to bear arms. So that's the first example right there in recent history. You also had people who were told to go to the Superdome, that's where they go get help, and they were not allowed to leave. So I'd be very wary. If FEMA tells you, oh, yeah, you'll be okay, go on in there, and we'll take good care of you. Then you try to leave, and they won't let you leave. We will not obey orders to detain American citizens as unlawful enemy combatants or subject them to military tribunal. Now, why is that one there? Well, sadly, post-9-11, a lot of folks were so afraid of Islamic terrorists that they supported and were willing to go along with claims of executive power that included the, the claimed power of the president to declare any one of you, any American citizen, not just foreigners, but also American citizens, to be unlawful enemy combatants and detain you in military detention without indictment, without trial, or even to try you by military tribunal. Where in the Constitution is that power granted to the president? They claim it's in Article 2 under his, his powers as commander-in-chief. But does, he have, does Congress have the authority and the power to declare the war on the American people? No. They have no authority whatsoever anywhere in the Constitution to treat you like a foreign enemy. What is the constitutional remedy 
foreign American accused of making war against his own country or aiding the enemy. Treason. treason. Article 3 spells out, the, it's a treason clause, tells you it must be a trial for treason. And it must include two witnesses to the overt act. Because the founders had seen the abuse of the treason charge in English history. Where you can be charged with treason in a secret trial, tortured until you, until you confess your sins, and then executed, and simply for speaking out against the king. So they want to make sure it had to, be, it had to be two witnesses to an overt act of aiding the enemy or making war against your own nation. And it had to be in an open court. It's in Article 3 for a good reason. You have to have a trial in a civilian court for treason, a jury trial of your peers, before they can ever take your liberty or your life because you aided the enemy or made war against your own country. They can't just simply set aside the Bill of Rights because it's wartime and say, oh, you're an unlawful enemy combatant, as though you were in Afghanistan or Iraq. It's a very dangerous claim power. It's something that may lead to resistance by people. Um, real quick, I want to tell you this. Before Bush did that, this claim power actually came from FDR during World War II. But even in between there, right after Oklahoma City, there, was two, there were two uh, lawyers who wrote a law review article for the Oklahoma City Law Review where they argued that the powers of, of uh, laws of war should have been used against McVeigh and also against all of the militias. They said McVeigh and all the militias should be detained in military detention and the, the uh, trial by tribunal should be used against them. Now, what do you think would have happened if Clinton would have been foolish enough to follow that advice and try to apply the laws of war to the militias, round people up without, without indictment, without jury trial? What would have happened? They'd have fought back because their worst fears would have, been, would have come true. They'd have said, hey, we told you they're trying to destroy the Bill of Rights, and here they go. They'd have, have, they'd have felt there was no recourse but to arms. Now, thankfully, Clinton didn't try that. Problem is, is that theory, that proposed power, has now been given teeth and given precedent by the Bush administration. And then they handed those claimed powers over to Obama. So the precedents, the modern legal precedents and claimed powers that Clinton did not have at his fingertips, Obama now has. And what does the DHS consider to be the biggest threat to the United States now? Is it Islamic terrorists? Who do they consider to be terrorists nowadays? Yeah, veterans, returning veterans from war are a potential security threat. They, they think you are. If you dare to call yourself a constitutionalist, in their mind, that's the equivalent of terrorist. So all the powers that have been put in place, the NSA, DHS, all the claimed, uh, all the claimed authority of the president to act as commander-in-chief, even here at home, all of that is being turned inward on you. Like all the cannons being built out like that are being swung around. So that's why we issued this Declaration of Ten Orders. We want certain things not to be done. The, last, the uh, fourth one is, we will not obey orders to impose martial law or a state of emergency on a state. Don't forget that it was during martial law under General Gage that the attempt was made to disarm the colonists. And after the fighting started in Boston, General Gage told the people in Boston, if you will turn over your arms to an independent third party, We'll let you leave. And so they turned over their arms, and they were not allowed to leave. And their guns were confiscated. That was done under martial law. In our Constitution, where do you find anything that says anything about martial law? Is it in there? Can the president declare martial law? There is no power to declare martial law in our Constitution. Martial law is the absolute absence of law. It is nothing more than the will of the commander on the battlefield. Martial law is what you impose on a conquered enemy. It's what we imposed on Germany, what we imposed on defeated Japan, what we imposed in Iraq and Afghanistan when we invaded. That is martial law. You do not, the government has no authority to do that here at home to American citizens. Absolutely not. It's illegitimate. We will not obey any orders to invade and subjugate any state that asserts its sovereignty. I thank God for the recent resurgence in sovereignty resolutions across this country. I think it's a fantastic sign. It surprised me. It's a very good sign to see people standing up on their state rights and the independence. She called it state powers, actually. The independent sovereignty of their states. Now, 
Look at Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution. It says right there, that's the Republican Government Clause. But it also says that the federal government shall guarantee to each state a Republican form of government and shall, upon application of the legislature or the executive, if the legislature cannot be convened, that's the governor, shall protect them against insurrection. So even if there's an insurrection in the state of Texas to try to overthrow your state legislature, the federal government cannot step in to this state unless your legislature or your governor invites them. That is an example of your independent sovereignty. We will not obey any order to blockade American cities, thus turning them into giant detention camps. And as I said, in Katrina we saw that happen in Superdome. Folks were not allowed to leave Katrina. They couldn't cross over those bridges. They were blockaded in. We will not obey any order to force American citizens into any form of detention camps under any pretense. And of course our enemies say, oh, that's ridiculous. How's it ever going to happen in America? Well, it happened during World War II. U.S. citizens of Japanese descent were interned simply because they were Japanese by race. It has happened here. It can happen again. When people are afraid enough and driven into a frenzy of fear, they will, they will do things like that. They will call for things like that to be done. You will not obey orders to assist or support the use of any foreign troops on U.S. soil against the American people to keep the peace or maintain control. As we know, as we know from our own history, the Crown resorted to, to mercenaries, to foreign mercenaries, the Hessians, to try to enforce their edicts upon the American people. Foreign governments throughout history have done this. They've hired foreign mercenaries when they could not trust their own troops to do what they want done. So, that's why that's there. We, we will not obey orders to confiscate the property of the American people, including food and other essential supplies. Denial of food has been a weapon of war for many, for many thousands of years. Stalin and Mao used it also to purge and kill off their enemies. Pol Pot in Cambodia did the same thing. They used starvation as a weapon. We will not obey any orders which infringe on the right of the people to free speech, to peaceably assemble, and to petition their government for redress of grievances. That's the last one. So those are the things we encourage the military to draw some certain lines in the sand on, and then we encourage them to go further and read their own constitution, learn their own heritage, read the Declaration of Independence, and think for themselves. I don't want to spoon feed them every possible unlawful order out there. I want them to think about it for themselves. Because when it comes right down to it, they don't have a hotline to me or any other lawyer. They don't have a hotline to the Supreme Court. They have to make a decision right there on the ground about what is lawful and unlawful. They must decide. We want them to think about it ahead of time so that they will have the courage and integrity on the spot to say no. Okay? Um, how much time do I have left? I'm done? I'm out? Okay. I'm going to say one more thing we're doing. Uh, I want to also tell you that um, as part of our the side about the veterans take, taking the responsibility for themselves and their communities and helping out, here's one thing we're doing, a new program called Family Safe. What that's going to be is Oath Keepers will volunteer to be the host families for any current serving police, military, or fire during time of emergency. They can send their family over to an Oath Keeper home to be safe while they're doing their work. So we'll pair up like a current civilian police officer with a retired cop who they, they know they can trust. And if things go sour and they're out there under emergency conditions, they can put their family in that person's house and not worry about them. So we encourage you to do the same thing. Now, Sheriff Max can get up here and talk about the responsibilities of the county sheriff. I just want to say I'm out of time, but I just want to say that it's incumbent upon you to start right here in your own communities. Get to know all your, all your police and military. Make sure the veterans know the police and military and then support only constitutionals for office. And I would start with the, first with the county sheriff. And that's why when we first had our, our rally on April 19th, 1775 on Lexington Green in, in uh, Massachusetts, we invited Sheriff Mack to come talk. Because I knew that he'd be an essential ingredient in restoring this republic. His message is, is, is profound and fundamental. And so without any further ado, I'll bring up Sheriff Mack. Who lowered the mic? <laughs> I, uh, 
I just can't tell you how happy I am to be here and thank you and don't want it too high. Don't want it. Um, I thought about what I could say that would be the most important thing I could say and uh, instead I've got a program here I want you to see just real briefly to get maybe some of our uh, freedom juices flowing, not that Stuart didn't get them flowing. But uh, I want I want to play this clip from uh, it's the one that says Virginia. Where'd we lose it? Anyway, I'll, let me know when you're ready, and I, I'll just do a commercial message while we're at it. I, I do want you to know I, I do have a commercial, uh, a, a real live one. So don't be offended. Now at the beginning of my book, um, it actually. Uh, the uh, forward message is from Patrick Henry. And it's his famous give me liberty or give me death speech. And it starts with that very thing. Um, the question is one of awful moment to our country. Does that kind of apply today? Should I keep back my opinions at such time through fear of giving offense? I should consider myself guilty of treason and an act of disloyalty to the God in heaven, which I revere above all things. That's from Patrick Henry when he started that famous speech. I'm not going to withhold what I know to be true because somebody might be offended. So let me make sure you know and understand. That's why I'm going to be saying what I'm saying tonight. We need to act like the Founding Fathers. And that's exactly what Patrick Henry started. We always hear the end of that speech, don't we? Give me liberty or give me death. Yeah, we hear that all the time. Even politicians will say that sometimes. But we know about those liars already, don't we? So, uh, so I'm not going to withhold my opinions through fear of giving offense. So let's go to Virginia. Yeah, let's play him real quick. This is from the movie Gettysburg. Let's see if we can hear this guy. What are we doing? Did we lose him? Nah. Oh, and that's one thing I did want to do also. Uh, I want to thank the Patriots of Gillespie County. This is about the fifth or sixth time I've been here. So thank you. Um, did we put that DVD in? Is it in? Is it in? Okay. Okay. And... Um, Stuart Rhodes was talking about Oath Keepers. Well, I have something to say about the original Oath Keeper. Michael New. And his parents are here, and I'd like to have them stand, please, and be recognized. <laughs> Daniel, there they are. I still know the good name is for uh, that's an achievement. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, you guys just whistle when you get that. I've got a lot more to say, but uh, I don't know if um, all of you are aware, but at the National Convention for Oath Keepers, uh, Michael New was uh, given a Lifetime Achievement Award for what he did in being the original Oath Keeper uh, of contemporary times. And this was way back before uh, anybody was talking about the oath. Michael knew was risking everything on the line, put everything on the line for his oath. And that's kind of an amazing deal, what he did. And, uh, you know, I tell people all the time that, you know, that Barbara Mandrell song, I was country when country wasn't cool. Well, Sheriff Mack was state sovereignty before state sovereignty became a vogue issue now that you're seeing all across the country. Well, Michael knew was way before me and way before any of this putting his uh, life and career on the line just to do one thing, to keep his oath. And Stuart Rhodes and Oath Keepers were sensitive enough and smart enough to see that that had already happened in modern history. And, and of course, he uh, was honored by them. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, Michael New has some great parents. I hear music. 
Okay, uh, you need to double click. Double click on the red F first. Let's try that. Double click on the red F. Right. Actually, right on the F. Yeah. Double click that. Let's see if that'll get us rolling. Man, I hope that'll get us rolling. It's thinking. No? We can't get in? Ah, yay, we're in. Okay, now hit, yeah, now hit big, and now hit the right space bar a bunch of times. Keep going. We have the technology. We are there. Almost. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. Nope. We like him too, but... We like him too. <laughs> You're free man and free man you ought to be. We don't like him. He's no back. Back. Where'd it go? No, that was it. It should have been right there it is. Yay. Okay, yeah, play that. Put the sound up high. Government derives its power from the consent of the people. There we go. Let me make this very plain to you, sir. We do not consent. And we will get consent. And what you've got to do is you've got to go back over there to your parliament and you've got to make a good plan to them. You've got to tell them that what we're fighting for is a, is a freedom from what we consider to be the rule of the foreign power. I mean, that's all we want. That's what this war is all about. Yes. No, 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 no. Now, now we, we established this country in the first place. With very strong state government, just for that very reason. I mean, let me put it to you this way. My home is in Virginia. The government of my home is home. Virginia would not allow itself to be ruled by, by some uh, king over there in London, and it's not about to let itself be ruled by some president in Washington. Virginia, by God, sir, is going to be run by the king. <laughs> Now, we're going we're gonna to come back to something on that here in just a minute, but I apologize did he, that he didn't say Texas and Texas. <laughs> but uh, you, can re, you can certainly replace Virginia with Texas. Well, Virginia's and, up but, in North Texas, isn't it? Yeah, that's close. <laughs> Thanks, George. A little geography lesson from George there. Um, now, remember... I'm not going to be fearful of giving offense. And I hope that most of us are on the same page. And I'm not going to wax political right now, okay? Because you have someone running in this state that believes in that. Yes. Deborah Medina. <laughs> Deborah Medina. You have somebody here that will do that. You have somebody who knows and understands that principle running for governor of the state of Texas. Everyone in this room should be taking that out of here and taking it to the streets and making sure she gets elected. For God's sake. And I'm, I'm amazed that a woman of her caliber is willing to put herself on the line. And, and the reason I'm not going to, and I said, I'm keeping my word, I said I would not wax political. Well, I'm not talking about a politician, so I'm not. If I was talking about one of the others, I would be waxing pol political. And I'm not going to do that, because I'm sick and tired of politicians. And that's why I love Deborah Medina. And I'll tell you another thing, Deborah Medina is a friend of mine. And I wish that I lived in Texas so I could vote for her. But if she gets elected, I'll move here. You know? so. Now make sure every one of your cars has a Deborah Medina bumper sticker on it, okay? Is there a way we can get some of those passed around tonight? Well, let's do it. You can do it on my dime or my time. I don't care, but let's have everybody putting them on. Now... I, said, I told you I do have a commercial message. I do got to take a time out for that because I actually do have a corporate sponsor and he's really behind me. And his name is freezedryguy.com. And it's a food storage company. 
And let me tell you, I've done food storage for a long time, and I've never seen anybody that has this good a caliber food that will store for 25, 30 years. And he has something most of the others do not have. Meat. Real meat, okay? So it's freeze, you know, like freeze, okay? And uh, dry, like not very wet, and guy, like the opposite of gal. Freezedryguy.com. So if you haven't had a, if you haven't started a food storage program yet, make sure you get a hold of him. Go to his website, and uh, he'll send you food. I've been using his foods for years, and it's it's a great company and and something. Bottom line with food storage is this, and I, I used to give lectures about this too. Is whoever controls the food controls you. You don't want anybody controlling your food supply except you, for you and your family. And that, that's really gospel. So let's let's get involved in this now. If we can, I want to. Can we go back to any of this here? Um, it's not going to be sound. We don't need sound. All we need is for you to bring up. We're going to start with uh, now. Most of you know when I was sheriff in Arizona. I sued the federal government. I sued the Clinton administration. And, um, and, and that's really, I guess, what's brought me back to uh, being on the lecture circuit is because that case is being resurrected because it was all about state sovereignty. And there's some things in this case that you need to be aware of because it is the most powerful state sovereignty monumental decision in the history of our country. And yet it's been hidden from you. And now we're putting this back on the forefront so that people can be aware. Uh, you just got to double click again. Yeah. And let's see. Okay. Yeah. Right arrows. And and let's go. Let's take it slow. There's a, there's one guy I want to see. There's a quote from. Uh, yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. No, wait. Let's go back. I want to see. You're going to like this. Uh, yeah. Play that one. You got to hear this. This is so amazing. I can't believe that Hollywood can get it. Okay? You know, uh, be a Wow. Yeah. You see, sometimes it pays to go to the movies. And, and isn't it amazing that Hollywood can get it about the oath? They got it. Now we're going to make sure that the rest of our sheriffs across the country get it. We're right now in the formation stages of an, uh, an organization called the Constitutional Sheriffs Association. And I've already got 15 current sheriffs from across the country. They're going to be on the board of directors. And we're going to take this battle to the, to the streets, to every sheriff in this country, to every peace officer in this country, of which there are almost 700,000. And we're going to make sure that every one of them have an opportunity to learn how to become a constitutional sheriff. And so... I'm going to ask each of you to consider this. When you're talking about donating your funds to a worthy cause, 
in the next few days of where your money that you have for that that would be available for that. How important do you think it is that our nation's police and especially our sheriffs, of which there are 3,100, that if we could get maybe half, and I know we can do that in Texas, that we could get half to become constitutional sheriffs. If we get that funded, we're going to make it happen. Now you can do it. We don't even, our website just started, but we don't even have a way to donate on that website, constitutionalsheriffsassociation.org. We're still going there. You can still go to sheriffmac.com and there's a place to donate there to the Sheriff Project, to No Sheriff Left Behind <laughs> Project. <laughs> yeah. So you can donate there or you can donate tonight. Make sure you donate to the Patriots of uh, Gillespie County also. But if we, if we could get, if we can get, uh, some donations coming in, then the organization and the kickoff for that group is going to be all that quicker. Remember what you're dealing with when you talk about that. We mutually pledge to each other our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor. And to what? To this holy cause. I've dedicated my life to this. Four months ago, I had a full-time job. I don't have it anymore. And I've traveled with Deborah Medina and trying to help her get elected. And I'm endorsing a, a constitutional sheriff candidate in Orange County. And I'm uh, traveling the country and we're starting, and as uh, Angela said, the first uh, Constitution for Peace Officer training seminar is going to be in Gillespie County, Fredericksburg, Texas of the United States. The first one. Okay. And we actually have other sheriffs who believe in this movement, who want to devise the plan to make this happen the fastest, the quickest, quickest, and most effective way. And that's what we're doing. Constitutional Sheriffs Association, um, and I might add America. Click this forward. Let's go forward now. I want to start with Z on um, my case. Usually you start with a talk, you start ABC. We're going to start with Z. We're going to the end. Go. Okay, go. Keep going. Wait, go back one. Boy, I, I, go back one more. There. And that's quoted in this book. That quote is in here. This is the first district court case right here. Judge John Roll got it. Look at what he's talking about. He's talking about the oath. He's saying Mac is thus forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the act. He got it. This is the reason I filed the lawsuit. This is the reason I lost, I risked my job and risked everything to go against the Clintons. And you know how that can be. <laughs> and, and that's what I told, a lot of you know uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio from Phoenix, Maricopa County. Yeah. Well, well, Sheriff Joe is a friend of mine, and I told him the other day, he's got to quit lying. And he goes, well, you know what? Because he has that book, The Toughest Sheriff in America. I said, Joe, you just took on the drug dealers, street gangs, and prostitutes. I took on the Clintons. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. <laughs> but see, Judge Rowe got the principle of the whole case wrapped up. A federal judge. If he can get it, I believe every sheriff in this country can get it. But we've got to put the, ma the message and the information in front of them. How are we going to do that? Constitutional Sheriff's Association. How are we going to do that? With your help. Okay, Okay. let's roll forward. Man, I, I just hope I can get to Z. You know, but this is so many me amazing things. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Okay. We're going to come back to some of this, but this is what we want to go here. Okay, wait. Keep going. Nope, keep going. Keep going. Okay, keep going. Okay, nope, keep going. Keep going. There it is. This is Justice Scalia who gave the opinion for the majority. In Mac 
Prince versus United States. And this is the order. This is the last paragraph. This is what he is telling the United States Congress and the federal government. This is what the ruling in this case is. We held in New York, that was New York versus United States, where it was on another Tenth Amendment issue. States' rights. Do you have a candidate running that knows and understands that? Uh, what's her name? Oh, yeah. Devin. Yeah. We held in New York that Congress cannot compel the states to enact or enforce a federal regulatory program. Let me ask you guys a question. Uh, would nationalized socialistic health care be a federal regulatory program? Does the state of Texas have to participate? No. God. Of course not. Today we hold, that's the Mac Prince case, today we hold that Congress cannot circumvent that prohibition by conscripting the state's officers directly. In this case, the sheriffs. Okay? The federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. Next page. It matters not whether policy making is involved and no case by case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. End quote. <laughs> Who is the other sovereign they're talking about? They're talking about the states. If your governor doesn't know and understand dual sovereignty, don't vote for him ever again. In fact, if, if you know just any candidate for any office that can say the word constitution and states and the phrase state sovereignty without choking, vote for that one. Okay? Because we're getting close. But you've got the epitome of the candidate here. And, and, and I hate to keep harping on that, but it's so absolutely vital. You have such an opportunity this year to exercise this with a candidate that knows and understands it. Now, let's go to the next one. This, this is it. No, this is it. This is the dissenting opinion. This should absolutely boggle your mind and you should go, oh my gosh. No wonder we have an out-of-control federal government because this was a 5-4 split. If we had lost, this would have been the law of the land on this case. Is it any wonder Congress thinks they can do whatever they want? Because this is the mentality of, US, of Washington, D.C., of our United States government. If Congress believes that such a statute, the Brady Bill, is what we're talking about here, will benefit the people of the nation and serve the interests of cooperative federalism better than an enlarged federal bureaucracy. Like, yeah, they really care about that. They don't want enlarged federal bureaucracies in Washington, D.C., do they? No, what a joke. Get this, though, the last line. We should respect both its policy judgment and its appraisal of its constitutional power. Are you kidding me? Folks, this guy sits on the United States Supreme Court to this day. He was there in 97, and he's there to this day. What? You know what? This proves that I made a mistake when I filed this case. I should never have filed it. We don't need to pass another resolution. We don't need to pass a Second Amendment resolution. We don't ask permission. That's asking permission. We have state legislatures and a governor and sheriffs who know and understand what state sovereignty means. And you enforce it. And you put the stop sign up to the federal government and say, you're not doing that here anymore. Now, read my lips. If you ever come back here and commit any more of your crimes, and if you and your IRS buddies come in here and confiscate property and do anything else that's outside the Constitution, the constitutional sheriffs of the state of Texas will take action against you. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Now. And, and this is this is the, the thing. When I did this lawsuit, we didn't form a committee saying, oh, you know what? If we get Sheriff Mack to be the first one in the United States to file against the Clintons and the and the federal government on this Brady Bill thing, maybe we could get him to run. You know what? He would be in a key position to run for United States Congress or Senate or maybe governor. You know what, folks? There was nothing like that. This wasn't a political move. In fact, this was a decision made between three people. Me and my wife and the God in heaven. That was it. No one asked, will this help my political career? In fact, I told my wife this would probably end it and a lot worse. We'd lose our home, we'd lose our job, career, but okay, we'd have to move. And you know what? All that came true. And you know what? Praise the Lord. You know, we just say the thing. You know? And, and, and I learned something that every politician um, probably ought to consider. And especially every sheriff in this country. If you're running for office, it might just happen sometime that you'll lose. Okay? It happens. I've lost some, I've won some, and every politician probably needs to have that attitude. But never have the attitude that you're willing to compromise the freedom of the people in order for you to keep your job. It's a lot more important to keep your word and to keep your oath than it is to keep your job. And that's what I learned. And that's a simple lesson. Right? And, and so I, I, want, I want you to really grasp the uh, power of this case. And you know what? I've been called because I associate with people like you and Stuart Rhodes and, and Michael New's parents. They're very dear friends of mine as well. I've been called radical. Okay? And, and it, isn't it kind of funny that when you quote the Constitution and Declaration of Independence and the Founding Fathers, all of a sudden you're a radical. Well, praise God for that one too then, you know? Yeah, you know? But on... In my book, uh, The County Sheriff of America's Last Hope, uh, I, I say something pretty radical. And remember what my theme is tonight? We're not worried about giving offense, right? And uh, my wife says I do that far too often. But uh, James Madison quotes, kind of paraphrases what I say in the book and what I've said on my website. And it, I say this, the greatest threat to God-given constitutional American liberty is our own federal government. And it doesn't please me to say it. I wish I didn't have to say it. But the Founding Fathers knew where, where that was too. And they devised a constitution and a Bill of Rights specifically so that the federal government would remain in check. One of the most important power aspects of the Bill of Rights is the power guaranteed to the states to be the ultimate check and balance against too much federal power. And the, the federal government has only, and it's in the case, and I, I've got the case, the whole one right here, which is ex those excerpts come from, and then, it, and then it says that the federal government only has discrete, limited, enumerated powers. And those are detailed in Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. So any time this 10th Amendment tells the federal government, any time you want to expand your authority or you want to get creative or you want to force nationalized health care down our otherwise healthy throats, you have to refer to the 10th Amendment. And the 10th Amendment basically tells the federal government this. If you think we forgot anything, you can't do that either. Okay? And that's the 10th Amendment. And James Madison paraphrases my warning of where I'm very bold and blunt and give the bottom line real quick. He says it like this. This is page 19 of the book, last paragraph. There are more instances of the abridgment of freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments from those in power than by violent and sudden 
usurpations. Or he should have said maybe foreign attacks. And so the only problem with this is the encroachments are no longer silent, nor are they gradual. They're bold right in your face. And as Angela said earlier, where are you, what are you going to answer when your children ask you, where were you when our country was being destroyed from within? What did you do? What were you thinking? You always talked about freedom and liberty in our home. And yet, what did you do to make sure our freedoms were guaranteed? Now look at the mess we have. And let's make no mistake, America is on her deathbed. She is. And there's only one thing that can revive her. And that's we the people performing CPR. Constitutional principled resuscitation. Okay? Right? All right. Now, the book, the book gets into the case, and, and you'll notice, I don't like writing, I mean, my first book was way too long. I don't like writing long books. Because you know why? I know now, with a small 50-page book, that your sheriff has no excuse not to read it. Okay? <laughs> You can say, hey, Sheriff, and he'll say, hey, I already got that book. And it, Good, give it to one of your deputies. Because we want them to know and understand these principles as well. And some sheriffs, there's one sheriff in Texas, maybe somebody can give me his name afterwards because I need to talk to him. There's a sheriff actually passing these around. Uh, that Somebody emailed me, but I haven't got that. I haven't got his name. But the key point of that is that you, you can say, look, you can read this while you eat a donut. Okay, <laughs> so this is easy, and and right at the beginning of the book, of course, the book is all about the foundational principles that our country is based on, and are we going to defend those principles? That's the question. It asks, Sheriff, will you stand against tyranny? Will you protect your citizens from tyrants? Is there anything, anything of all the important things that your sheriff does that's more important than that? Protecting liberty, protecting freedom, protecting property from the wolves. And does it really matter to you where the wolf comes from? Or if the wolf is wearing a three-piece suit and carrying a fancy attache case? It doesn't matter to me, does it? Yeah, in fact, some of those guys are worse than any wolves that come from the street gangs. And you'll lose a lot more property. And, and your children, too. A lot faster to those guys. And so Thomas Jefferson, on the first page of the book, gives us a warning. Quote, When all government shall be drawn to Washington as the center of all power, it will render powerless the checks provided and become as venal and oppressive as the government from which we separated. End quote. The question I ask in the book, Sheriff, to whom can your people turn when the federal government and state government becomes venal and oppressive? Who can they turn to for peace, safety, and protection if not the person who raised his right arm in solemn oath and promised to protect, uphold, and defend the Constitution of the United States? He promised to protect uphold and defend your constitutional rights. And why do we take that oath? Do you know why? Because it's required in the Constitution itself. The founders set forth that every state and local official will be required to be bound by oath of allegiance to the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. So if they don't take an oath to the Constitution, they're violating the Constitution. And then we hear this all the time about we're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Where do we find in all of these foundational documents the purpose for which we have government officials? It's the very next line. It almost sounds religious. 
To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Wow. There it is, the Declaration of Independence. Why do we have sheriffs? Why do we have governors? Why do we have state legislatures? Why do we have a president? Well, well God only knows that one. But from, from your dog catcher all the way down to the president. <laughs> we, uh, they all have to take that oath. And I want, to, I want you to know and understand there's a, there's a real principle involved in this. And it's the principle of keeping our word, knowing and understanding what our oath is about, and knowing and understanding the history of America. And that's what we're going to be teaching uh, this Tuesday to a bunch of police officers. I studied the Constitution when I was a rookie cop. I made the big mistake of reading and studying the Constitution. And I, the reason I did that was because I, I had an epiphany occur in my life while I was on duty that made me realize that I'd become a by-the-numbers jerk instead of a constitutional guard. That's what every cop and every deputy and every sheriff in this country need to be, is a constitutional guard. I learned to love the Founding Fathers. John Adams, man, oh man, and his wife. Do you know that we owe her as much as we owe him? She refused to call him home from his post. He spent three years of the war in Europe. Why was he in Europe? You know what he was doing? <laughs> He was getting us help. And we needed his diplomacy for funding and for help from France and other countries over there. We would have, we would have never won the war. We, he was to diplomacy as Washington was to the actual command of the army. And, and here's Abigail Adams having a stillborn child and refusing to bring her husband home when she needed him the most because she knew we needed him. And he was needed in this great war. And at the beginning they talked about Washington, the type of leadership that he had. I know that there's sheriffs like that in this country. There has to be. I'm going to find them. I'm going to spend whatever I have to to find them and to make sure that when the right information about what made America great and the miracle of the making of America, that we find these sheriffs who come on board and, be, and the, the sense of patriotism becomes so strong in their hearts that they would never allow you to be victimized by the IRS or FBI or EPA or OSHA or DEA or anybody else again who pretends to be here to take care of us. And never, never, Never ask the government to take care of you. Because they will. <laughs> and we've seen what happens to people they take care of all the time. And, and the most important line, probably, and perhaps from my uh, Supreme Court decision, and it is one line. And Justice Scalia is quoting... Um, Another prior case where he said this, quote, But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. That's on page 36 of the book. Don't you wish that every sheriff in this state and every legislator in this state knew and understood the principle of But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions? It divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely so that we may resist the temptation to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day. End quote. A crisis, I'm afraid to tell you, that is caused by our own federal government far too often. And now we need people who recognize all across this country and especially in this state and I honestly believe it. I've said it in other states that I honestly believe that Texas will be key to the sovereignty movement. And the sovereignty movement means we have no higher authority. 
on page 15, it talks about that uh, uh, right out of right out of the case, right out of Mac Prince versus United States. The great innovation of this design is that our citizens would have two political capacities, one state and one federal. We all get that, don't we? Get this. Each protected from incursion by the other. What? So who's supposed to protect you from incursion from the federal government? The state government says it right here. It's in the Supreme Court decision, folks. Written by Justice Scalia. The local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. Huh. No more subject within their respective spheres to the general authority than the general authority is subject to them within its own sphere. Now remember... Where do we define the sphere of authority of the federal government? Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. Anything outside that belongs to the states or to the people. That's it. And so Justice Scalia goes on, even more powerful than this. Quote, This separation of the two spheres is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. End quote. It's a structural protection of liberty that we have your sheriffs, your state legislatures, and your governors standing against the incursions of the federal government. Hence, get this, hence a double security arises to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other at the same time that each is controlled by itself. <laughs> this is stuff is amazing. Now, do you want to know how to reduce the risk of tyranny? A healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. Didn't you want to know that all along? How do we reduce the tyranny and abuse from the almighty federal government? A healthy balance of power between the states and them. If you have a state that believes they have to submit to nationalized health care or EPA uh, regulations or all these other baloney policies and bureaucratic nightmares coming out of Washington, D.C., then they are sadly mistaken, and so are we. The state of Texas is sovereign. And just like this guy said at the beginning, Texas is not taking orders from no president in Washington, D.C. Texas will be governed by Texans. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I know we don't have a lot of time here tonight. And there's a lot more we need to be saying and there's a lot more we need to be doing. Tonight, when you leave here tonight, make sure that you have at least three things that you're going to do to help the holy cause of liberty. That's what Patrick Henry called it, in the holy cause of liberty. Make sure that you've got somebody in mind that you're going to help get elected. Make sure you have a plan to donate to some things that really are worthy of, this, of, of your precious dollars. You can keep sending them to the, to the cesspool of corruption in Washington, D.C. Or you can do what I quote in this book, what Alan Keyes suggested. And he said, quote, The only difference between today's slavery and the slavery of the Old South is that at least the plantation owners paid for the chains. Folks, we have got to stop paying for the chains. And you know that there's one state right now, and I believe it's Missouri, who is looking at some real serious legislation about collecting all federal taxes and sending those only which they believe the federal government deserves. So, 
When we follow the Constitution, some amazing miracles can happen. It was a miracle in the first place. And at one point, uh, John Adams was asked, why would we take on this humongous Goliath federal government, the Great Britain, Crown, Army, Navy, they have it all. What could we hope to achieve against them? And John Adams said, quote, Duty is ours. Results are God's. My dear friends, my fellow brothers and sisters of Texas, let's do our duty and leave the rest to him. Thank you so much. Start from that, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Sheriff Mack. Thank you, everyone. You may be seated. I won't keep you much longer. Just want to say a few things. Uh, if you haven't received some direction tonight, uh, you must have been either asleep or outside of this building. You've got some points that have been made. Uh, you can go away from here challenged and inspired. But I also have a challenge for you. As we've talked about on this next Tuesday, on the 9th, here in Fredericksburg, we're putting on the Constitution for Peace Officers class. Sheriff Max will be teaching that class. My challenge to you is, on Monday morning, you need to contact, whether you're from Fredericksburg, Texas, whether you're from San Antonio, whether you're from Mason, wherever you're from, contact your local law enforcement and ask them, are you attending this class? Because it's free. There are always some concerns with law enforcement as far as whether they're going to be able to take off time or whatnot. But this is four hours. They can at least come and represent their department or send someone to represent their department. So my challenge to you is contact your local law enforcement your chief of police, your constables, your game wardens, your state police, and ask them, are you coming to this class? And then ask them why not if they tell you no. On behalf of the Patriots of Gillespie County, we want to thank you for attending tonight. Uh, as I said in the beginning, there are tables in the back with a lot of information on some of the things we've talked about tonight. Uh, please get that information. Thank you. <laughs>